Well, today we are going to start looking at the Gospel of John. Um, the series is going to be generously called That You May Believe. And many of you, if you've been around the church for a long time, will be familiar with this as this is that you may believe the, the, the very purpose of, of John's gospel. And he says so in, in chapter 20, in fact. He says, these things I have written, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and then that by believing, you may have life in his name. And that's John 20, 31. And today we're going to start way, way back at the very beginning of this. We're going to start with what is often called the prologue, uh, the first 18 verses of the first chapter of the book of John. If you're not familiar with John, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it's the, the fourth of the Gospels in order. If you don't have a Bible, there are some in the chairs. There's also Bibles at the Welcome Center. And we encourage, I encourage at least, that you can use your version if you've got a smartphone, iPhone, Android, whatever, iPad. Look up YouVersion. YouVersion is a wonderful app for reading things in the Bible. And so feel free to pull out a Bible because we're going we're gonna to dig in on verses 1 through 18 in, in John today. And uh, let, me, let me read those to you just to kind of kick things off today. I'm going to read first, I'm going to read John um, chapter 1, 1 through 18. So it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world, it was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came into his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh, and it dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the, as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Then it says, John bore witness about Him, and he cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made known, or he has made him known. And there we read the word of God. Now as you hear that and you think about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You ever actually paid attention to how the Gospels begin? Now, I would say, of course, you have at some level. I mean, you've been to a Christmas service, many of you. And, and Matthew and Luke, as you might expect, begin in, in, in a way that makes sense. They, Matthew and Luke start off with, with Jesus' birth, right, in, in, in Bethlehem, and, and angels, and the stables, and the shepherds, and the stall, and the wise men, and all that, right? We, we've heard that story. And then you get to Mark. Well, if you don't know about Mark, Mark's kind of always in a hurry, and he can't be bothered with all of that. And so Mark jumps right in at the, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River with John the Baptist, right? And, and those first three Gospels, Mac, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we sometimes call them the synoptic gospels. That's a kind of fancy, you know, seminary word. Um, because we call them the synoptic gospels because of the similarities that they share with one another, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of them, um, as it were, begin with Jesus down here on earth, right? At his birth or at his baptism. He's, he's down here on the earth below where we dwell, with us, among us on the earth, in ministry, in, in flesh, and in blood. But then we get to John. And if you know anything about John, John always kind of seems to mostly do his own thing, in his own way, right? 
he, he, he's different. He likes to be different, or he seems to like to be different. And, and John immediately, as we read this, throws out there that Jesus is God. He doesn't start off on the earthly plane. Instead, he begins up above. His eyes are, are turned heavenward, right? As he begins to tell the story of Jesus, he begins with what are, in fact, some of the most sublime words that have probably ever been written in all of literature. One of the early church fathers, I, I think it was Gregory of Nicaea, but don't quote me on that, but I think that's right. Um, but, but he once said about the book of John, that the book of John is, is such that an infant can paddle in it, but yet an elephant could swim in it. Okay, an infant could paddle in it, yet an elephant could swim in it. And that's a very beautiful description of, of this rich, deep, broad book. There's something in the book of John for everyone, right? Because I mean, if you've ever done evangelism, if you've ever been somewhere where you're trying to tell somebody about Jesus, maybe they've accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and then they're like, oh, now what? Right? Well, most of us go, well, read the book of John. Right? To, to this newborn Christian, because John is a, is a wonderful place to begin your studies about learning who Jesus was. And if you're not developed theologically, you don't want to jump in at Leviticus, Leviticus or, or Hebrews or even Romans, right? We want to start them at John and don't scare them away. But yet, as you dig in, there's a depth and a breadth in John, uh, a deepness, a beauty. There, there are truths in this, even just very in this opening verse that, that a little child could understand, yet that are incredibly, incredibly deep and profound. Truths that, in this little passage I just read, that, that, that stretch and, and, and almost baffle even the most scholarly and educated of minds. And so, as we look at the book of John, keep in mind that a child can paddle here, but an elephant can also swim here. And in these opening verses, the Apostle John introduces us to the centerpiece of the whole gospel. And as I mentioned, usually these, these verses are referred to as the prologue. Okay? Um, John's gospel, if you've not studied it before, can, can effectively be divided into two different parts. Uh, the first 12 chapters of the book of John introduce us to the, the signs that Jesus gives. These, these signs that are given to show his real identity, the, the various uh, miracles that Jesus performs. And, and then John, as he writes, will not add in every, every now and then, well, this was the first sign, and then, then was, this was the second sign, and here, here's another sign, and so on and so forth, and as he further goes along in his storytelling. And so because of that language that John uses, in scholarly circles, sometimes the first half or first 12 chapters, I guess, are, are often referred to in John as the book of signs because he keeps using that language. And then from chapter 14 on until the end of the gospel, Jesus, as you read this, you'll see, uh, withdraws from the world and begins to, to focus his ministry upon his disciples and, and those who are, who are close to them and begins to share with them these, these profound mysteries of his being in person and, 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 and is trying to get them on mission. And in those chapters, uh, Jesus is revealing something of his inherent glory as he does this with them. And so because of that, that the second half of the Gospel of John is often referred to as the book of glory. So we've got the book of signs and the book of glory. But in these verses here in this prologue, um, the beginning, this opening, so to speak, this introduction to these two halves of the Gospel of John, um, we have, if you're familiar with music of what an overture, like to an opera or something else is, where, where you get these little snippets, these, these, these segments and portions of what the major themes to come are going to be. Uh, John really weaves a, a wonderful opening here, really does do some neat things that we're going to dig into here in just a moment. And, and he's going to share kind of, here's a taste, a foretaste of the feast to come, as you may have heard, depending on your background of church, right? This is, this is you know, just a little sample 
uh, of the delights that we're going to dig into, John says. Here you go. And so he kind of sets us on this path. He points us in the right direction and gives us a shove and says, jump on in with me. And so he wants us to see, for instance, uh, in, in verse 16, uh, that from the, the fullness of the grace of Jesus Christ, we have received blessing upon blessing upon blessing if we're Christ followers. And then how have we received those blessings? Well, he tells us that in verse 12. He says, by believing in the name of Jesus Christ. And that is precisely why he has written this gospel. And that's why he focuses on Jesus in order that we might believe. So with that kind of as my introduction to the introduction, let's jump in then at our first point. If you're taking notes, you'll see it in your bulletin. And the first point I want to make out out of this passage as we just read um, simply is this, that Jesus existed before the beginning of creation. There are three different stages of the glory of Jesus Christ that unfold in this prologue. The first of these stages has to do with the origin of Jesus. If you're, if you're following along, look at the opening two verses. In fact, even just look at the, the very first couple of words, the very th first three words in English. It's actually just two words in the original Greek. But it, look at those first couple of words. It says, in the beginning, right? In the beginning. Now, those of you who, who have your ears attuned to Scripture, when you hear that, what do you think of? We think of Genesis, right? The very beginning of the Bible, the opening of the Bible. The book of Genesis begins with, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So see what John is doing here. John is taking you further back than what the other Gospels have. Matthew, if you've studied Matthew, you know Matthew takes you all the way back to Abraham, right? In his first chapter. But that's not back far enough for John. And John is is saying, if you really want to understand who Jesus is, if you really want to grasp something of the glory of Jesus, then you have to go all the way back, way, way back, all the way back to the very, very beginning. Back, back to that moment when, when matter was being formed, when, when particles first came together, when those subatomic particles finally met one another, right? And forces came into existence by the creative word of God. John says, that's where you need to start if you want to know about Jesus. And what John is saying is that at that very moment, when, when creation itself, when all of this came into being, the Word of God, or Jesus as we know, Jesus was already there. He already had existence. And if Jesus was already there at the beginning, then Jesus is not to be thought of as part of the creation. He is uncreated. He is not part of the world. He is not part of the universe. He's not part of our solar system. He's not part of this great universe that we all get to live in. Because at the, the very, very moment when this creation was all brought into being, he already was. He already had been. He already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, that, that's kind of easy to say, right, isn't it? And it's easy to write that out, but it's truly one of the most profound sentences that has ever been written. And I think if you were to search literature, <coughs> I don't care if you go to Shakespeare or whoever you want to read. I'd challenge you to find something more profound than just this little simple opening statement that John makes at the beginning of this book. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Either Jesus was God, and he was with God, or he wasn't, right? And if he was God, and he was with God, then he is, of course, God. It can't be one or the other. This is a binary kind of choice. But then how, how can you be God and be with God? 
pastor at the same time, right? How does that work? Well, let's talk about that for a little moment, right? In order to get out of that conundrum of a problem of, of course, some have resorted to changing translations of the Bible. If you change the Word of God, it's no longer the Word of God. That's the rule of the Word of God. Okay? Things like, for instance, the Jehovah's Witness have done this, where they've intentionally mistranslated the Bible. They have a, a version called the, the New World Translation of what they call the Bible. It's not the Bible. It looks like the Bible. They call it the Bible, but that doesn't make it the Bible. And they resort to twisting and changing the language. And what they do is, if you don't know, they say that the Word was with God and that the Word was a God. Right? In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was a God. That little article, a, a. I mean, there's nothing shorter than that, right? They, they, they sneak it in there. It's not in the Greek. I'll tell you that. I've studied the Greek. You don't have to. You're welcome to. It's tough. But it's not there. And by sneaking this little article in, this what sounds like a, a little small thing. It's just the word letter A, right? But what that does is that says instead of being God, he's just a God, right? Among other gods, a, a demigod, among the pantheon of gods, but not the God, right? And that's a problem if you believe what the Bible says. And it's neither grammatically nor contextually compatible with what John actually writes. John didn't say that Jesus was a God, some minor deity. John says Jesus Christ was God. The only God there is was Jesus Christ, says John. And don't miss this because it's important. Because if Jesus isn't God, then I am still in my sins. If Jesus isn't the true God, the very God, the same substance as the Father, then we are all still dead in our sins. But the good news is that Jesus is God, not a God. And that's what John says. And here's a, another error. He's not the only one who is God. Now, if you've studied Trinity, if you've studied theology, I used to teach confirmation courses. I would tell the kids that I was teaching, we're going to talk about the Trinity today, and at the end of this, your brain might kind of feel a little slushy. Because when we study the Trinity, it, it takes some thought, it takes some work. This isn't a simple, easy little concept. Because you see, Jesus is not the only one who is God. And now I'm using my language very carefully there because we're on a precipice. If you go too far one way or the other, you fall off into heresy. He is God, but he's not the only one that is God. He is God, but at the same time, he is with God. Face to face with God. Literally, towards God, as the language uses it in Scripture. Moving in fellowship, in harmony with God, Jesus is. And there is one God. We affirm that. And within that, that oneness, there is more than one. That's Trinity. There is God the Father, there is God the Son, and there is God the Holy Spirit. And John wants us to understand that before the creation of the world, before there was any matter or particles had ever come into existence, that the Word of God, that Jesus, already had being. And that the Word of God, that Jesus Christ, was in fellowship and in harmony with God the Father. And you know why he's telling us that? Because as he goes on in verse 18 to say, because no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Do you want to know what God is like? Well, of course you do. That's probably why you're here, right? 
And John is saying, God is like Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is God and has been fully enjoying the closest possible fellowship with the Father for all of eternity and will continue for all of the rest of eternity. That as we look at Jesus, that is who God is. Isn't that the most beautiful thought that you could have? As we look at Jesus, we see God. That, who, that is who God is. That here, here, here is the Father, right? And, and here is the Son. And they are one God in, in perfect communion and fellowship with each other. And in the, the mystery and communion of the Trinity, uh, Jesus has come into the world to make something of that mystery of, of that one God in three parts known to us. And that's extraordinary and that's unique. There's no other religion in the world that has anything like that. Where God came down in the flesh to dwell among us, to redeem us. So that when you enter into fellowship with Jesus Christ, through that you, you begin to experience something of the intimacy that God the Father and God the Son had before there was time. And that is one of the most beautiful things that, that we could think on or experience in this life. God is glorious, as is fully in Jesus and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Point number two. Next thing I want you to see is that Jesus is the creator, and John wants you to see that. Well, if the, the first thing is the origin of Jesus, the second thing John points us to is creation, right? Look at verses three and four. Two things that, that John tells us. He says, all things were made through him, through Jesus, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John is saying at least two things here. He's saying first that, that Jesus created everything, and that he is the very one who sustains all of it. Jesus made everything. And he sustains all of it. Creation and providence are in the hands of Jesus. He might be unrecognized by much of the world, but, but look at it again. He is God, not only because he pre-existed with God from before creation, but also because of all of the characteristics of his deity are expressed by him through his creation. He creates all things and he upholds them. Jesus is the creator. Now, why is this important to John? Well, because one of the things that John wants to tell us is that Jesus' great ministry is to recreate. You know that if you are a Christian today, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you know that you are a part of this new creation, right? Paul says it in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. And what is taking place at that point in the heart and the soul of the believer in Jesus Christ is an act of recreation. And I think that is why John is referring so much to creation in this opening chapter. And then there's this, this wonderful climax, you may remember, at the end of the Gospel of John in chapter 20, when Jesus comes back in, in his resurrection body and he does something that's extraordinary. If you know John 20, if you've read that before, you know that, that Jesus breathes on his disciples. He breathes on them. And, and, and it is often sometimes mistakenly thought of to be kind of like a, 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 so to speak, a pronouncement of the coming of the day of Pentecost, right? When the Holy Spirit's going to be poured down. But I don't think that that is what John is actually referring to. So why does John refer to this act of, of Jesus breathing on these guys, right? I mean, none of the other gospel writers even mention it. Because just as John has been reading the first chapter of Genesis as he wrote this prologue, I think John has probably been reading the second chapter of Genesis as well. You remember what's in the second chapter of Genesis? You remember what goes on there? How God created out of the dust 
us as humans, Adam. He breathed life into him, right? This thing that he had created. And it may well be here that, that when John refers to Jesus as the creator and sustainer of all things, that he wants us to see this as well. That Jesus is the one who is coming. Not only to, to save individuals like you and me, but that we might have even greater, amazing things that Jesus is saving. That as we believe in him, he's coming to create a new creation, to recreate as he's recreated us. We know that as we read on later on to a book that was written after the book of John from the book of Revelation. Jesus comes and recreates his creation. And then the third point that John wants us to see is that Jesus took on human flesh and its form in all of its weakness. See, if the first thing had to do with, with Jesus' origin and the second thing has to do with creation, then the third thing that John wants us to see has to do with Jesus' incarnation. Because the, the glory of Jesus Christ is seen not only in the origin of Christ, not only in his creation, but also in how he is incarnate. Look at verse 5. It says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then if you skip ahead to verses 10 and 11, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Now, if you haven't studied it, the word flesh in Scripture is Bible's word for humanity and our, our weakness and our, our frailty, right? Our flesh. And so what John is saying to us is that when Jesus was born, he became incarnate. His, his, it was God and his full deity fully taking on our humanity, humbly coming down with us, lowering himself to our level. He didn't come to be born in a place like a palace with all the accoutrements that would come with that. He didn't, didn't come just to hover above us. He actually came physically into this world. And God made his dwelling among us. John says that in verse 14, right? He dwelt among us. Other, other translations use the wording, he tabernacled among us, right? Some of you who know some of those versions. What is the significance of that wording, the tabernacling? Well, that, that tabernacle is the one place in the past in the history of Israel where holy God and sinful men and women could, could come and meet together. One of, the, one of the names in the Old Testament for, for the tabernacle, it was the tent of meeting, right? Because that's where God the Shekinah, the, the, the glory cloud, shined with all of his magnificence. And yet, it was a place where sinners could come into fellowship and communion with God. And John is saying that this word, that Jesus, who was with God and was God, has come now and made his dwelling among us. He took on flesh and blood. He came into this, this world as a, a human being. He lived our, our physical and social and spiritual environment. He, he knew what it was like to be like us. He shared our, our pains and our frustrations. He's saying the word became flesh. He's saying much of like what the author of Hebrews says. We do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We have a high priest who knows our frame that we are dust. You see, Jesus knew what it was to be tired. He knew what it was to be exhausted, right? He knew what it was to be thirsty. He knew what it was to stand before a tomb and weep. He knows what it's like to have his back lacerated and torn apart. He knows what it's like to have the pain of the rusty nails pushed through his flesh or to have the crown of thorns forced upon his skull. He knew what it was to be betrayed. He knew what it means to be lonely. He knew what it was like to be single. And you see, what John says, it's just a, 
a little glimpse of the glory of Jesus Christ and who he is. And then you see the response to this. Look at the response in verse 10. The, the world didn't recognize him. And 11, his own didn't receive him. Here's Jesus in all of his magnificence and glory and splendor. And, and men and women refused him. But oh, look at the response in verse 12 of though. What happens here is so beautiful. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Uh, maybe you came here today in a spiritual fog. Maybe you're struggling in a spiritual darkness. Jesus Christ is the light that pervades that darkness. Maybe you feel spiritually drained, dry, empty. Maybe your soul just feels like it's afloat and lost. The only thing that can ever resolve that is Jesus, the Word of God. The only one who can fill that need. And we as humans try to fill it with so many other things. And those things, they tend to destroy us. The only thing that can truly fill that need is Jesus. How? As it says in this passage, simply by believing in his name. John says, by believing and trusting in Jesus. How many of you have read C.S. Lewis's Narnia Chronicles? Some of you? Yeah, yeah. In the very final book, in book seven, The Last Battle, when Tyrion and, and Lord Diggory are, are, are looking into the stable, if you remember that. If not, well, listen along anyhow. Um, they look into the stable, and there's an astonishing statement that's made in the book. They look in, and, and, and they realize the inside of the stable is bigger than the outside, right? And, and if you've read this, do you remember what Lucy says? Lucy is a girl from the real world. And Lucy says, in our world too, a stable once had something bigger in it than the whole world. A stable once had something bigger in it than the whole world. You know what this prologue that we've talked about today is meant to do? It's not meant to bring about deeper comprehension. It's meant to bring Wonder, awe, reverence, a sense, a sight, a little glimpse into the glory of Jesus Christ. And I hope that you got a, a little taste of that today and we're going to continue to dole some more of that beauty and wonder and joy and awesomeness in the days and weeks to come. I hope that today you leave with a, a new refound sense of wonder and reverence as you go forth from this place into the world that God loves you so much that he came into the world. The God who pre-existed before the world, who created the world, loved you and came here for you. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. Let's pray. Lord God, we are just amazed, humbled, blown away by the greatness of your glory and your great love. And you, Father in heaven, we just pray that as this morning we've barely scratched the surface, we've barely, barely just made a, a little hole to peek through at the astonishing reality of, of who you are and of your love for us. Lord, this morning as believers in Christ, we, we say and commit ourselves that we trust and believe in Jesus. Jesus, we take you as our Lord and Savior. God, we, we bow down before you in all of your amazing beauty and glory and sovereign majesty, and we worship you and we adore you, and God, we rejoice that we get to mingle our voices together with the angels and the archangels as we, as we declare you to be the King of King and Lord of Lords. God, continue to pour your blessing out upon us. Continue to share your grace and your mercy 
with us. And then God, as you share your great love to us, may we take that and share it with others. God, with everything that we have, it is all a good and glorious gift from you. And may we never be the stopping points of your grace and mercy. But instead, God, may we be funnels. May we be a people who, who channel your blessing to the world around us. So God, as we go forth this week, may we go forth with a renewed sense of awe, a renewed sense of your love, a renewed passion for loving you in return for the love that you showed us. Truly, God, you are amazing. We are amazed and humbled and rejoice in the beautiful, high and holy name of your son, Jesus. Amen. If you do need some prayer today, we'll have a prayer team here at the front. You're welcome to come on down and they will rejoice in praying with you. Otherwise, go forth this week. Go and serve and love in radical ways that everyone will know that you follow Jesus. Go and serve your king. Amen.